Uh, many of you know David, or at least have heard him speak at various events. He's been at uh, Ag Research's MMA campus for a long time now, uh, where he's a senior scientist working in farm systems and in environment fields. As you'll know, he's got a wealth of knowledge and experience in livestock nutrition. And what's great for us is that he's based in Otago, so he's very familiar with our conditions and our farming practices. As Olivia said, we're keen to make this an interactive session, and so I'd love you to uh, use that chat box and post any questions, and uh, we'll, we'll take a, several little breaks along David's presentation to, to handle those questions and uh, put some answers together. So welcome along, David, and thanks very much for joining us tonight. I'll hand over to you now to get uh, the discussion underway. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Andrew. Uh, much appreciated. Um, it's always good to um, see a few familiar faces out there, even though we're not looking at faces. Um, welcome along. Uh, the, what I was going to talk about tonight, as we said before, was um, managing uh, winter feed. And so hopefully as we go along, um, you will be able to just uh, fire in any questions that you have as we go. In the brief, there was things about uh, feeding fodder beet and brassicas and the pros and cons of each. Um, the benefits of assessing crop yield and feed budgeting. Uh, it sounds like you've been doing some assessing yourselves, which is a good thing. Um, different livestock classes and how to handle them. So. Um, and we'll talk a wee bit through that and then about what sort of extra feed you might have. We won't talk too much about that uh, decision making process because that is very individual. And if you want any other questions answered, um, please put them in the chat box so that Andrew can pass them on to me. To answer some of those questions, what I wanted to do was to go through some of our winter crops and think about um, what they are made of and how much you might get. And are they really any different? And to illustrate that difference, I want to talk a little bit um, around uh, condition scoring in sheep and the impacts of changing condition score and the influence that some of our different feeds might have and talk about some of the more recent research that we've been doing looking at um, fodder beet feeding particularly and trying to understand that in terms of what uh, the, the what that feed is made of um, and we'll also talk then a little bit about um, potentially balancing your feeds and trying to make sure that it uh, works effectively for you and then at the end, just revisit some of uh, some of the work that we did through the P21 program and before that in our four day grazing program, which just sort of might help us uh, come out in spring in better condition. All righty. So can we see the whole screen, everybody? Can I, Andrew, can you see that whole screen? Or because I have a little um, yep, box can. on the side here. You're all, you're all okay? That's all good. <clears throat> okay, so, so we're getting into the, to the point where we've gone beyond on kilograms of dry matter and we're starting to talk about energy these days. And so I have just characterized the energy content of some of the diets that, you know, especially our winter forages, there and you'll note that at the bottom of the pole are kale and turnips and at the top of the pole is fodder beet. Um, and that's mostly related to how much sugar is in them versus um, how much fiber is in them. They are all very, very high quality diets. Uh, and we must acknowledge that before we get started. The thing that sets them apart is the second column, which is the protein content. And the protein content drives animal performance. Once energy is, you've got enough energy there, then it's the protein content that's very, very important. And you'll note here there is a much bigger range going from fodder beet being our lowest through to leafy turnips being our highest. And part of that can be explained by the fact that the percentage of leaf in something like fodder beet is very low uh, and then it goes up and you get to rape and to leafy turnips for example. 
and the amount of bulb or stem is opposite of that. And so this is all stuff that we already know pretty much. Um, but it's always useful to have those numbers in mind. So the first instance there, um, the uh, energy is fine, it's the protein we're watching. And then of course we have our winter crop yields. And interestingly enough, this is, uh, this is actually published data that's been recorded all around New Zealand. And these are the averages that you get to see. Now, there's a lot of talk about fodder beet diet crops being very large. The average measured all around New Zealand is 17 tonnes. The average Swede crop is somewhere between 14 and 15 tonnes, about 14 and a half actually. Um, Madden kale is relatively similar if it's sown at the same time as the Swedes were rape a little bit less. Turnips and rape not far apart, leafy turnips obviously less than that again. Um, but the interesting thing then is looking at the potential low and high yields. Um, and what you find is that fodder beet, for example, can go much higher than the other crops. So this is the reason why you would go out and measure your crops to figure out where you sat in that scale. Um, whether you've got a 20 ton sweet crop or a five ton sweet crop because there's consequences to changing that yield. So as yield increases, for example, in Swedes, then the amount of energy in the crop goes up and the amount of protein goes down. And that's because you get less leaf and you get more sugar stored in the bulbs. Okay, so, so the bigger the crop you've got, even though I said before, that uh, their protein content might be 12. If you've got a really big crop, a 20 ton crop, then their protein content will be less than that. If with fodder beet, it's exactly the same, more energy and less protein as the yield goes up. With kale, interestingly enough, you get less energy and less protein because you get big, tough stems developing. And so the quality overall goes down in both instances. Uh, with rape, again, the stems thicken, so you get a decline in energy, but because your protein concentrations were relatively high because of the extra leaf, then even though the protein goes down, it usually doesn't become critical. Um, and then turnips and leafy turnips, again, not too critical in terms, especially in terms of losing protein as those yields go up. So, so this is quite an important part of your consideration when you're feeding these crops, if you are trying to feed them to animals with specific uh, needs in terms of if you're trying to achieve live weight gain or if you are feeding ewes in late pregnancy in particular. This is uh, quite critical to the performance that you're going to get, these changes here. There are some other minor changes when you have a look at different cultivars. Um, and if anybody's interested in trying to find out a little bit about that, there is some published work on the New Zealand Grassland Association website. If you have a look in there and just type um, fodder beet or swedes uh, or brassicas into the search engine there, it will take you to papers that have more detailed information about all of this sort of stuff. So, so keeping that in mind, that the energy content of all of them is relatively okay. Um, with kale, I think we sort of, if we might be on the cusp, if all of a sudden we grow a really big crop of kale and we're trying to expect animal high animal performance out of it because the energy is dropping. But in most problems that you're going to have is if the protein drops. So why is that important? Let's have a think about trying to feed our livestock with it and how much energy do we need or how much protein do we need? And so here I've given you a little bit of a table here. It says when the animal's dry, it only needs about eight megajoules of ME per kilogram of dry matter in the diet to maintain itself. And it needs relatively little protein as well, only about 8%. As the animal is pregnant, the ME goes up. You're looking at now about 10, an ME of 10 to maintain that animal. 
and the protein requirement goes up quite considerably, heads up towards 14%. Um, with a lactating animal, you're now looking at an energy concentration even higher, up towards 11, uh, and the protein concentration at about 18. And I spot a mistake there, and those people who have read any of these tables in the past will notice it. Growing animal, you need 10 plus to make any useful uh, growth, the ME of 10 plus, and you need a protein of about 14, not 18, as I've got written there, and we will correct that. So it's only about 14 for a growing animal, same as a pregnant animal. Those are quite important, those indicators. And again, that's one of the reasons that you would go and test your feeds and your crops to make sure that they meet those um, requirements, depending on which livestock class you're going to feed it to. All right, so we've noted there is a huge variation in yield across um, all of New Zealand and between the cultivars and between your cultural management practices. And there's also quite a large variation um, in your uh, protein concentrations across it's those feeds as well. Yeah. So, Dave, before you go on, just, just relating to your last slide, we've got a question. Um, does energy and protein change the longer that uh, these crops are in the ground for? So that's a really, really good question. And the, the first, the first uh, part of the answer is the longer the crop is in the ground, um, the more mature it gets. And the more mature it gets, that what there's two parts to that. One is there are less leaves on the plant because they, they die off as the plant matures out. So lower leaf means lower protein content overall. Uh, and the other part to that is as they get more mature, and this is especially with uh, rapes and kales, um, the stem hardens off. So it becomes quite um, lignified. And as a consequence, it also, uh, you get less protein in those stems as well. So, so the short answer is yes, it does. It depends. If you have a relatively low yielding crop, which hasn't done so well through the season, and it's still got room to grow, then it will maintain relatively high quality. If you've already grown it out, um, then what you will find is not only will the protein concentration drop, but you will also, the yield will drop. So a classic example of that was some rape crops, which were measured in May uh, in one of Charlotte Westwood's study. Um, by the time they got to August, those crops had lost four tons of dry matter. Um, and all of that dry matter loss would have been leaves and therefore the protein would have dropped and the, the overall quality, the energy would have dropped as well as the tonnage going down. So yes, um, these crops do mature out and that is quite significant. Just, just another question on those similar lines. Um, someone wanted to know are many, many sheep and beef farmers actually testing uh, dry matter content of kale crops? Um, there's a really short answer to that. No. Very few farmers actually do any testing at all on crops. Um, most farmers get to May and have a look at their crop and think, oh yeah, I think it'll last for the winter. And that's about as much testing as they do. So very few actually go and have a look and try to get a decent handle on it. One of the easiest ways, the easiest ways you can get a good handle on your winter feed crop is enter a winter feed competition and they'll do it for you. There you go. There's an opportunity. It's excellent, excellent approach. How are we doing on the questions, Andrew? Uh, we're all up to date. We've covered the ones so far. Thanks, Dave. That's all good. We'll move on then. We'll move on. Just as soon as I get this to work, here we go. Okay, so I just want to um, touch on some recent work that's been done, and it's a it's an amalgamation of a bit of work from um, our team at uh, Palmerston North have been feeding uh, fodder beet to pregnant ewes, and then a little bit of work that we did um, back in the um, 
early teens uh, in Southland and a little bit of Tianao work as well. And we've, we've sort of put that together in a little table here to give you some idea of if you were lose if you were to lose one condition score on your use during pregnancy what that would mean to you and i've split it because of the new work that we've done at palmerston north we've been able to split it between what's the impact of an energy deficit versus a protein deficit right um with an energy deficit if we lose a condition score in use, there's potential for you to increase your U deaths by somewhere uh, around about 8%, six to 8%. That is kind of significant. So that's when they start a winter at condition score three and go to condition score two. That's the average of the mob. Obviously there were some at two and a half and they went to one and a half. Those animals are very prone to um, any significant changes in, in feed quality and quantity and weather events as they um, start to lamb. Um, if they've lost that condition with protein from a protein deficit, as you would see with a fodder beet crop um, or a very um, big swede crop, um, the UDS are around about the same. We don't seem to see very much difference in that. But it's when um, we get to lamb deaths that it is really important. And what we see that condition score, one condition score loss probably increases your lamb deaths by about 12%. Um, whereas if it was induced by protein, it's probably nearly twice that. So, so if you uh, don't balance your diet for protein and get enough protein into those ewes, um, in that sort of last uh, month before lambing, um, that is a very, very serious consequence. And then lamb growth beyond that, um, we think about 30 grams a day for uh, a standard energy deficit, which means you're about three kilos light at weaning, 100 days. With a protein deficit, you could be up to six kilos light. So immediately we have to start thinking about which feed we, we feed to which livestock class. And so if we have very high yielding swede crops or high yielding fodder beet crops, twin bearing ewes are not the things to feed them to. Even as early as, certainly not from scanning onwards, uh, you should be trying to either balance those crops up or um, feed them to something else. All righty, so there is a thought, some of the latest work that we've done. Now how about growing livestock? What happens when the feed doesn't meet requirements? And so what I've done on this table is overlaid changing energy, which is the black line on the left, and the axes is on the left, and this is just an example of lamb growth. The potential, if we're starting at nine, an ME of nine is very little, and by the time you get up to an ME of 12 and heading towards 13, you're starting to get the potential to grow those animals at 350 grams a day. Now, the interesting thought is that um, quite often we can't do that on brassicas, and they do top out a wee bit. One of the reasons is the blue line, which is um, the protein concentration. And so what you see there is, as the protein concentration rises to about 10%, it yeah, virtually no growth. And then it rapidly increases towards its potential. And by the time you get over 13 or 14% protein, uh, you're heading towards the potential of that animal. So if you could imagine that you had um, a diet with an ME of 11, which might give you 200 grams a day uh, for lambs as a potential, but it only had 11 protein, which gave you 40% of that potential, then you might grow them at 50 grams a day. And that's what those two graphs mean. So, so it's that combined balance that's the important thing when you're trying to predict the outcomes uh, for, for growing animals. 
So if there are any thoughts or questions around that, uh, quite happy to take those. Uh, Andrew's still on mute, so he either hasn't found the button. Oh, here he goes. I know it's not necessarily winter feed related, but does that relationship bear true for um, other times of the year, say lambs that are growing on, on pasture? It bears true all the time. So these are, these are fundamental first principles of nutrition and we'll, uh, you can apply those in any circumstances. They are more critical in winter because we usually start playing with feeds that aren't high quality pasture. Alrighty. So what does this mean? And we just, this is an example uh, from the South Canterbury Advance Party, which is a um, deer discussion group, um, where they had looked at feeding fodder beet and they were trying to solve the problem. Why do, why do our young stags um, stop growing after sort of about six weeks, 40 or 50 days on this stuff? Um, and so what they did was they had uh, some diets. They had several farms involved in this. They had fodder beet, they had baleage, they had PKE, and they had a nut that they were feeding to these animals. And you can see there that um, the crude protein, obviously, of the fodder beet's relatively low. Baleage looks quite high, PKE looks reasonable, and the nut is um, very good. And they obviously come at different costs. So what was the outcome? Well, on a fodder beet and baleage diet, they grew those animals at 60 grams a day in the middle of winter with PKE. They managed 90 grams a day, and with the nut, they managed 160 grams a day. And you'll note that the energy concentrations across there don't vary very much. So when we had uh, uh, to calculate those out, basically we, we got to the point where we're thinking that the fodder beet, they're eating about 1.3 kilos of fodder beet and about 0.4 kilos of baleage. Um, we added some PKE in, they were still eating a bit of baleage but they are now eating a bit more fodder beet because the PKE was providing appropriate protein. Um, and then we go and put the nut into the diet. Now we see they're actually eating 1.6 kilos of fodder beet because the, um, the little bit of the nuts that were in the diet actually balanced the diet appropriately so that one, they could achieve their intake and two, they could actually um, perform effectively on that. And if we have a bit of a look here, here's the total intakes in the second column, 1.7 versus 2 versus 2.2. And you'll note the crude protein rising there. And like I said, at 10, we weren't getting very much growth, but by the time we were over 11, um, you know, we we're, we we're getting another 100 grams a day growth on those animals. And uh, it's, that's, that's how um, important that, relatively small shift in protein is to, um, to animal performance. Dave, um, right to that, someone wanted to know what you can actually do with on a crop to increase its protein content. Um, Okie dokie. So there are, how do you do that? The protein content is relatively fixed, except in a few instances. So for example, if, if you were to keep the crop in good health with a few sprays and stop any fungal diseases in the leaf and keep more leaf on the crop, then you will be able to, then you, you increase the protein in the total diet, right? So that's, that's one way you could do it. Adding nitrogen doesn't necessarily change the um, concentration of protein in the bulb. So, and with most of these crops, it's the bulb and the stem that's a significant part of that yield. Interestingly, some work that Crop and Food have done using uh, comparing um, nitrogenous fertilizers with uh, potassium with, and versus sodium with your fodder beet shows that 
using sodium, you get a little bit less yield, but you get quite a significant lift in um, crude protein concentration. So, so that is one thing that you should investigate. So rather than pouring nitrogen and, and uh, potassium on those crops, you're actually using uh, salt as a fertilizer tends to um, improve the balance of a fodder beet diet. That's about the only one that I know of, apart from going back, like I say, having a look at the um, New Zealand Grass and Association proceedings, some papers in there, and they do have uh, some measured differences in the um, protein and energy concentrations of various cultivars. So it would pay to have a look at that. But your cultural practices, apart from maintaining a high level of leaf uh, and then maybe a, a a little bit of tweaking in terms of the um, the sodium fertilizer, uh, salt for using salt as a fertilizer on fodder bee, about the only ones that I have come across that can change that. Balancing the diet um, is something that we can do quite often. Um, a nutritionist will use quite a fancy computer program to do this, but interestingly enough, we can use a simple little technique uh, as long as we're only trying to achieve a balance for a single part of the diet. And so what we've got here is an example of a follow-on from our fodder beet discussion um, where we've said fodder beet is low in protein. So what we have here is um, uh, that we'll best be using the top line in the table what we're trying to do is balance protein. So the target requirement, the first number in the column there is 14%. And we know that fodder beet has 8% protein and lucerne hay, which is our balancing option, has around about 20%. So how would we go about that? Let's have a look. Okay, let's see if we can calculate the balance. Now this, is actually called simultaneous equations and it's the cheats method. But what do we do? So we've got fodder beet at 8% and we have lucerne hay at 20%. And so what are we trying to do? We're trying to get a target requirement of 14% here in the middle. And what we do is we take the difference between what our feed is across the diagonal here. So we take 14% as our target. We take off 8%, the difference is six. We do the same. For lucerne hay, target is 14%. Lucerne hay is 20%. So 20 minus 14 is six. Then we add those two things together to get 12. So 12 is our total. And then we take the proportion of each, as in the six there, divided by the 12, which is 0.5 obviously and a lucerne hay is 0.5. So that says that half of the diet has to be fodder beet. And to meet that protein requirement, the other half has to be lucerne hay. Now, this gives you uh, an indicator of how important that balance is. And it also gives you an indicator of how important the protein concentration in the feed is. If uh, lucerne hay is a higher percentage, let's say it was 24, then the difference here would be 10, and this would still be six. So this would now be 16, and so your ratio would be six to 16 up, uh, 10 to 16 up here and six to 16 down there, which would mean you'd be able to feed more fodder beet if the lucerne hay had higher percentage protein. Now, this is one of the reasons why you need to test your feeds to make sure that you know what you've got so that you make sure that that balance is appropriate. So if you underrepresent your lucerne hay in terms of protein, you'll be feeding more lucerne hay and less fodder beet. Uh, again, if the fodder beet um, protein concentration has changed or is higher than this, and there is some variations between cultivars and there'll certainly be variations between sites, um, you should make sure you get a test on that so you understand what those two values are. Now, lucerne hay has been chosen in this example because it also balances the fiber requirement for the animals at the same time. So you don't need anything else in the diet to do that balance. Now, if, for example, you were trying to balance a low quality silage uh, instead of fodder beet, um, then you'd already have all the fiber you needed. And so you could choose a different supplement 
which may have quite a lot higher protein concentration, which means you'd need a lot less of it uh, in the diet. So you may choose peas or lupins or um, soybean meal, which means you would use a lot less of that particular supplement. So generally, um, this is a very quick and easy way of having a look at around about how much you would need, um, and then you'll be able to carry on and uh, put that into the diet to make sure you meet the needs of the particular livestock class that you're feeding. Okie dokie, this indicates a significant change in the talk now because we've gone on to white backgrounds instead of gray ones. It's obviously important. And I wanna talk a little bit here about winter grazing managements. And a lot of the winter grazing management practices that we have been running, um, and we have been changing, which is a good thing, has been based on the research in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And that's when we had nearly 70 million sheep. And now we're producing as much lamb from, and I note I've got 40 million sheep, but that was quite a while ago. We're down to about 25 million sheep. And our ewes have gone from weighing 45 kilos to 70 kilos. And those are all very important factors when we start thinking about how we graze our ewes. For a start, we have to feed them more. And what we are aiming for now is instead of having a single lamb, the twins and triplets that we are getting born now are one to two kilos heavier, potentially than what we thought a single was in the 1960s. So that's kind of significant. And again, we're looking at weaning weight somewhere between three and 10 kilos heavier than we had in the 1980s. And that too is very significant. And the deal is that we need to meet that requirement during winter. We cannot recover it in spring anymore. So here's some work that we did in the P21 program um, with beef and lamb. And one of the questions that we were continuing to be confronted with is what happens when you go into the winter with lots of dead material and then you come out in the spring, right? In this instance here, what we were doing was we had uh, three different uh, pastures, high, medium and low dead, and we were tracking what happened to that dead material during winter and into the spring. And what you can see is that the dead material does disappear. The interesting thought is those measurements in August were after we had had some quite high stocking rates on those pastures to try and get rid of the dead material. The deal was the sheep didn't eat it and it doesn't go away until it slowly rots during the spring when the weather warms up. So that's kind of significant in terms of how you manage your sheep in the middle of winter. So if you're expecting them to eat, uh, clean out a pasture with dead material in it, um, what we found in this instance is all they did was stop eating and start walking around and around. So you might think they've done a good clean up job, but really all they've done is walk around and around. So if you want to clean it up, for Christ's sake, don't underfeed them, just walk them around and around. Chase them around with a dog and get trampled stuff in. Don't try and expect them to eat it. Now, there's more to this story. This is the type of growth rates that we got in August and September. Right? So with our high winter dead, we got about 24 Ks of dry matter. At a medium winter dead, we got 27, so we've got 12% more. And low winter dead, we're 46% more. So that is kind of significant to how you think about what you're going to do. So trying to get rid of that dead material in winter is important. However, don't expect the animal to eat it. So don't put it in the feed budget, just let them trample it into the ground. And here's an example of it being trampled into the ground. However, this is also an example of trying to do that under a daily shifting regime. This is a paddock in the same weather conditions under a four day shifting regime. And you'll note the difference. 
that is what we're used to occasionally. You get a bad night and the animals puddle it all up and they bury all the thing. You're not gonna have a dead material problem with that, obviously, it's a good thing. However, it could have looked like that. This is the difference between one day and four day shifting. With the proviso that we make sure that the animals are adequately fed. And that means they need to be able to meet their feed requirements. We are not in the 60s and 70s where we were feeding a 0.8 of maintenance. They have to be at least at maintenance and they have to be um, certainly post scanning uh, above maintenance. They need to be making sure you grow that fetus well so that the lamb uh, is born at a heavy weight and grows fast. In that program, we actually did monitor what those pasture productions look like. And this particular um, slide here, as you can see, it's a one day shifting regime. They had 30 mils of rain overnight, and this is 30 days later. Now there's the four day shifting regime 30 days later. And there's a couple of good reasons why these look so different. One is that the stocking rate obviously on a four day shifting uh, plan is only a quarter of what it is on a daily shifting plan, the instantaneous stocking rate in the paddock. Now that does a couple of things. One, it means that the animals don't um, trample all that feed into the ground. And if you were going down the track of using a, a one day shifting regime, we would expect somewhere between 12 and 20%. Probably we would aim for 15% of that feed would actually be trampled into the ground, would never get eaten. And if you are feed budgeting, please put it in the feed budget. Don't expect to be able to record it in the residual. So add that to the amount that you are allocating the animals, right? Put it in there. Otherwise the animals get underfed. The second part of this is when those animals um, are not under the same competitive uh, pressure, they don't run around trying to find the best feed they actually calm down and uh, work their way through it quietly and tend to because um, they don't trample as much in the ground, they tend to leave more behind, which means that your recovery is so much greater and faster. And this is what it looks like. If we said that the relative yield of is our one day shifting, which is what we have been used to, in August, the four day shifting was producing 80% more grass. So if we think that our um, average August growth rates are, let's say um, 10 to 15 kilograms of dry matter, we're looking at 18 to 23 kilograms of dry matter being grown in August under the four day shifting scenario. In se September, we're only looking at about a 20% increase, but again, that's, uh, about 30 versus 36 kilograms of dry matter, and then that difference slowly goes away. And what you see is if they're grazed in the wet conditions, then basically you are suppressing that growth. You're only getting about 75% of your um, August growth, and it's a long way from a four day shift. Uh, and that slowly recovers through to about November, that poaching finally goes away. It does go away, but um, it's a significant cost to your um, production system, especially in early spring when feed is at a premium. A couple of questions or comments in relation to that, Dave. Um, firstly, um, presumably this sort of a four day shift regime, you'd have to start right from the beginning of winter rather than bring it in part way through when they're already accustomed to that sort of feast or famine type mentality. Yeah, it's a good question, Andrew. Um, uh, we introduced this um, down at Woodlands uh, about halfway through winter, oh. uh, the first time they did it. Um, and 
the farm manager down there, Kevin Nola, basically said by the time they had taken out the fourth break, the animals had settled down. Mm. They um, reacted very, very quickly to that loosening of pressure on the animals. Mm. So, so that was a really good thing. I know mm. what you mean. You'd think, oh, yeah. well, we've trained them to be really bad, but apparently we trained them into good habits quite fast as well. So that, that's one point. Is, it, is there any more in there? Uh, and, the, and another question, someone was extrapolating the, the, the four day shifts on pasture. Should we be looking to do a similar thing where, for those animals that are on crop in that case? Swedes. Um, potentially you can. Again, as long as you are, um, as long as you're making sure that the feed budget is appropriate and you're not trying to uh, shortchange them. So the, when, when this system falls down is when they are not meeting their requirements, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so what and what we were finding is some of the guys in this program, especially really close to um, lambing, were still trying, were trying to use this four day shifting and they said, oh, the animals were still, they got really um, upset and they would eat it all in three days. And I'm going, well, they're eating it all in three days because they need it. When they're that close to, to, to lambing, it's not like they're going to put down any extra fat. And if they are willing to eat it, then they're obviously putting it into the fetus. Mm -hmm. They're obviously using that feed because there isn't enough space in there for them to overeat at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's a, a significant proviso. And the other one is if the feed quality is very, very high. So possibly couldn't do this on an Italian ryegrass crop or very, very high quality pastures which didn't have any in the dead in the bottom because again, it's really, it appears to be really hard to uh, control their intakes when they haven't got a little bit of feedback to tell them not to eat quite so close to the ground. Okay. Just, just another question that's popped up too in relation to that. Um, someone wanted to know what the, in, those tri in that trial, what the stocking rate was, how, how many use per hectare was it, was it done on? Yeah, yeah, I was trying to think of that the other day, to be quite honest. There was about 1,400 use in each of those mobs. Um, and I think in the, the one that you saw, the one with the 30 days worth of regrowth on, um, I think those ewes were getting probably about three quarters of a hectare a day. Mm -hmm. Something like that, just off the top of my head. It wasn't hugely long pasture. Um, yeah, so, so they would have been sitting maybe at around 2,000 ewes to the hectare. Mm -hmm. Just, just, an, and just while you're there, Dave. One, one other person is sort of going back to your um, your calculation about balancing the feed. Uh, yep. A query over costs. Um, you know, a fodder beet, uh, Lucian Hay diet. I guess they're uh, the, the person raising it is probably querying that that type of feed is going to be quite a costly, costly uh, option. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is the. Um, that's something you have to you have to have a good uh, think about. Um, if you had the opportunity to use something that was even higher in um, crude protein, there's potential uh, to reduce that quite significantly. So if you were going to use um, uh, soy meal or or rapeseed meal that was going to come in at 35% crude protein, you can use a lot less. And so then you have to very much have to do your sums on which feed is going to be the most cost effective and whether or not you can deliver it in the paddock to do what you need. Now, the beauty with Lucerne and hay is that you solve the fiber problem at the same time. Whereas if you go to something else like soybeans or peas or um, even white lupins, if you can get them, uh, you still have a fiber problem. So, so the, other, the other side of that is just don't feed it to your ewes. 
feed it to something else that doesn't need that high level of um, protein. Yeah, but every sit everybody's situation has got to be different, and they're all going to you're all going to have to do the numbers yourself to figure out what's most cost effective. Alrighty, so out of that four day shifting study, the messages from the farmers they all talked about the outcomes that they got. They talked about the ease of the management. They talked about lower costs. They talked about less work. They talked about less pasture damage. They said that it was easier on gear because all of a sudden you didn't need a trailer and a bike and be slogging around in the mud. Uh, it was better for pasture utilization. There was less fences required. They noted themselves that there's less bearings. Our measurement of that um, suggested that it was the fact that we had a uh, an even um, condition score, we didn't have large condition score losses that was that it wasn't just four day shifting that did that. Uh, and they noted they had better spring growth. Now the important thing from us as the team was all about the inputs that were required to make that thing work. So yes, that farmers got all sorts of great benefits out of it, but without the U live weight understanding what the averages and the range of those animals is. Without the U condition score, so we knew how much feed was on their backs and that we were meeting our intake targets, because condition score is all about meet, is giving you an indicator by which you know that you have fed them properly. If condition score changes, then you're either feeding them too much if it goes up or too little if it goes down. And it's the only way you can effectively measure it because in the middle of winter and as you get towards the spring the used live weight will go up regardless. So condition score gives you the idea of whether or not you're getting the energy balance in the animal right. We need to know how much feed we've got whether it be pasture or uh, crops. We need to know the quality uh, and in the grazing scenario it's about how much dead material is in the bottom in the cropping scenario, it's about is the crop fit for purpose and will it meet the requirements of things like protein in particular? And then you need to know, am I growing some grass and how big the paddock is? And we had one farmer in our study who knew all of that except the U live weight. And every, at the end of every winter, you would say, oh, I've fed them all, I know all the stuff and I've done my feed budgets and they always lose one condition score. Well, they always got to 65 kilos because that's what he thought they were. But when they're 72 to start with, then they're always going to lose a condition score if you only feed them as if they are 65 kilograms. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They will shrink down to the maintenance requirement that you give them. So all of those things are really important before you get the successes that the farmers pointed out. So with feed budgeting, really important to know there are a lot of tools out there if you want to do it. Um, there's the Feed Smart app for your phone. You can download that. Um, there's the Feed Master programs that Beef and Lamb run. You can do that for feed quality as well. Um, feed Master has um, feed budgeting software in it as well. Check out the Knowledge Hub and then the farmingsheep.co.nz website has a whole heap of the winter feeding stuff on it. And again, if you get to the bottom of that tab, you will find some quick and easy uh, feed budgets that you can download as well. So um, there's lots of free stuff out there to help do this. But as I said, you do need to know some stuff before you start. And again, you have to figure out what your, what the quality of what you've got and whether or not it will meet the needs of what you're feeding it to. Alrighty, so we're just nearly at the end here, methinks. So check the yield and the quality. And when I say quality, I really mean protein. Check that out. Like I say, you've got some indicators there. The bigger the yield you've got, the lower the protein will be. 
and therefore it should be a flag to you that if I want to feed this past uh, about scanning to my ewes, then I need to know what it is because I might need to do something about it or I might need to only feed it to one livestock class. The opportunity that sits in balancing the diet, again, you might go, well, if I lose 25% of my lambs because I've lost the condition score because the uh, protein concentration wasn't right, I'm happy with that. That's your choice. But now that I've told you what that is, you can actually factor that in and say, that's what it's going to cost me if I don't do it. And then you start to figure out, well, what sort of protein might I need? Is that still going to be useful? Do I just have to feed my vulnerable stock on something else while I use that for, I don't know, um, dare I say the dairy cows? No, I won't say the dairy cows because even the dairy farmers are finding that they're having problems with um, ongoing performance with fodder beet use. And it's about balancing that diet properly. Consider a few of the new grazing managements that we've talked about, but remember some of those rules. The animals must be fed to their requirements, otherwise it will not work for you. Um, and as you go into uh, any future winter, think about what that dead material looks like underneath and what that pasture is going to do for you in the following spring. Plenty of resources out there. So if you need to use resources to uh, help you balance something up or um, you know, get things right, uh, feel free to go and grab a hold of those because there's lots and lots available. So I'll finish there, Andrew, and are there any further questions? It's just one I've been sitting on. Um, when you uh, were discussing the, the, uh, the differences in the dead material of um, pastures in that study. Someone just wanted to know, is there a link between the amount of dead material in pasture and the incidence of bearings? Um, how much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> bearings bearings, is, bearings is, a real, is a real challenge yeah. to us. Mm. It's a huge challenge and we've been looking at it for quite a while and there's been research done all around New Zealand. Mm. And the one thing I would say is we do not know what causes it. Um, we do know that evening out their intake and trying to match what their requirement is and not getting big shifts in condition score up or down will help stabilize the animal and reduce the overall incidence but we still know that out there somewhere uh, we will get instances where we get that sort of explosive bearing syndrome. Um, and we think, yeah, we, uh, I think that that has something to do with significant changes in diet. So you take them off a winter diet where they had dead material and you put them on a, a spring feed diet where the grass is short green and leafy and they blow bearings. Now, mm. My thinking is it's the, it's the change in feed that's the problem, not um, one feed or the other. Yeah. Mm. So unfortunately, unfortunately, we haven't got the answer, Andrew. No. R related to that, but you probably answered it anyway, is yeah, another thought was that is autumn saved pasture and increase the bearing risk. But... Um, I, I yeah, again, they, did, they did do a study on that in the Hawke's Bay, trying to answer exactly that question, and the, the outcome was very inconclusive. Mm. Basically, they, they couldn't find a link. Mm. Yeah, so okay. still, still a uh, black box. Mm. Oh well, with that, uh, with that enigma, David, um, <laughs> there's, no, there's no, 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 no further questions at this stage. So, um, before I hand back to Olivia, I'd just like to thank you very much for your uh, presentation this evening. There's certainly been lots of little gems there that I've picked up on.